Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Back to Basics, Common Sense Law with yours truly, Preet Gill. Bankruptcy, foreclosure. These are some very important yet very complicated and at times very stressful topics that we've been discussing for the last four episodes. We've had the opportunity to discuss these matters with attorney Mark Anderson, who has helped us go through some of the very complicated processes. He taught us statute of limitations, which means the time when a bank or a debt collector can sue you. We learned about the automatic stay, which means that if you file for bankruptcy, everything gets frozen. We learned so much and it's complicated, right? Because how are we supposed to now apply that to our own life? So today's episode is going to be a little bit different. We are going to take the legal concepts that we have been learning for the last four weeks and we're going to apply it to real life examples. So after the break, we're going to dive right in and we're going to discuss these issues. So I will see you right after the break. Welcome back. This time we're going to have the opportunity to discuss real life examples and we're going to take everything that we've learned in the last four episodes and see if we can make sense of all these legal terms and these laws. But before I do that, I want to welcome back to our show attorney Mark Anderson, who has been with us for the last four episodes. Thank you so much. Thanks. I mean, Thanks for having me, Preet. Yeah, th I have some bad news for you today. Oh no, what? This is going to be your last show for a while. Oh my God. I know, we've had, terrible. We've, we've had enough, okay? I'm sorry. But the, pay, <laughs> the pay is so good. <laughs> no, seriously, thank you so it's much terrible. for taking the opportunity to go through some of these complicated issues. So I'm gonna dive right in and ask you a question. Oh, I like questions. So we've been discussing all these mistakes that banks can make, you know, or debt collectors can make, especially on your mortgage and a foreclosure action, right? True. And we discussed dismissal. Like, yeah, you can get the case dismissed if they make a mistake. Great. Sure. But are there any other remedies? What I mean is, are there any other solutions that are available if they do make a mistake? Well, um, we were kind of talking about this a little bit ago, but uh, there's minor problems, which is getting the case dismissed. But then if for some reason the case gets dismissed and they don't bring it back in time, for, for example, in New York, it's six years. In some states, it's 12. In some states, it's 20. In some states, they don't even have one. It's, if it's past the statute of limitations, they may actually be forever prohibited from collecting on that mortgage, and you could remove it as a lien on the property. Is there a term for this? It's called um, quiet title action. OK, I just want to reemphasize quiet title action. And please correct me if I'm wrong, quiet title actions is a lawsuit that you would bring against the bank? Yes, you okay. sue the bank and say, you can't have this as a lien on the property, or you can't say that you're owed any money anymore. So basically you're just saying, bank or debt collector, you've made a mistake, mm -hmm. right? The mistake is not anything minor, it's serious. Mm -hmm. For example, you have tried to sue me after your time has expired, Yes. right? And because the case was dismissed already, um, now we can do something else and now I'm going to sue you instead. Exactly. It's okay. really fun too. <laughs> That's nice. I mean, how do banks respond to that? Uh, they're super excited about it because <laughs> um, sure they they're going to lose a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so they fight it and um, it's good to have a knowledgeable attorney that knows what they're doing mm -hmm. um, so that they can fight all the um, crazy theories they come up with why it's not past the statute of limitations. So, but what, what could be their like legal defense at that point? I mean, I guess you kind of answered my question, but as, uh, really, and, yes. but they don't, they know that they're not going to be successful or at that point they just don't well, care. Sometimes they are, they're very creative. And sometimes the appellate court has to come out and, and give opinions about why they are or are not right. But you know, they could say when I started the, the case to begin with, I didn't actually own the debt, ah. so I couldn't actually start it to begin with. So they come. So basically, what Mr. Anderson is saying is, banks will find very creative ways, even though they're going to lose most likely, right? And they know that they don't have a case. But at this point, what do they have to lose? Because when you win, they're not going to be able to get the mortgage back from you, and now you own this house, this property, free and clear of their lien. Okay? They can't. That's it. So they have a lot to lose, so they will fight you, but that's why it's important that you have a lawyer that knows what they're doing. I mean, 
this is <laughs> some serious right. stuff. So, so tell me some other, so we've learned all these different, you know, uh, legal theories. Can you give me some fun stories? Well, I have one related to what we were just talking about. Okay, let's hear it. I was arguing it in the, the appeals court last week, which you know. Yes, I, I saw and, you. <laughs> and so this is a bank that started a foreclosure action, and then they didn't do anything. They didn't file a motion. They didn't file any papers with the court. They let it sit there and collect dust for 10 years. Why is that? Because they didn't care about it anymore until I got involved. And then they saw, oh, my God, there's, there's, we can make money here because we can litigate this. Okay. And so what ended up happening is, is that judge said, um, no, no, they, they actually uh, were interested in prosecuting the case. And then we took that up on appeal, and I guess we'll have to see how the judges feel about but it. But it isn't it in, in New York State now, I do know that if you, don't, if you sue somebody and then you just sit and don't do anything further, after a certain time frame, y your case is kind of deemed abandoned almost, right? right? And after one year. After one year. So after 10 years, ten years. the judge said that I they can do it. They did, because the judge, in my opinion, d doesn't want them to get a free house, my client. So why is it that these banks, I mean, if they have a foreclosure, I mean, if the mortgage is owed, and at that time when they filed the lawsuit, you know, they, they realize that they have a case, why don't they move forward with it? For a, there could be a lot of reasons. I hear a lot of grumbling from banks' counsels about why. Um, it may be because the bank uh, does not take the advice of their attorney, which we always discourage. <laughs> um, there may be uh, somebody else may have bought the debt, and maybe they lost some of the paperwork that's necessary to prosecute. Okay. Or they just may have forgot about it. Wow, they're that busy. For yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's I a lot of houses out there. I just want to remind our audience that you can call in, and ha if you have any legal questions, the telephone number is on the screen, um, and we'll be more than happy to discuss it. What I would say is please limit your questions to the specific topics. So we learned how, so, so basically this is still th the case that you were just telling mm -hmm. me about. So now you put it on appeal, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there hasn't been a decision on this yet. There's not. Okay, so can you give us any other real life examples? Oh, um, I have a good one. Okay, All let's right. hear it. Um, I have story a story time today. I have a case where a person was given an illegal loan. An illegal loan. So what happened was okay. is that they were given, let's say $100,000. Okay. But the money that they were given for the loan was actually kept by the person that was lending it to them because hmm. they owed money back to that person. Okay. Let's go through a mathematical calculation that doesn't make any sense. At the end of it all, the person ended up on that loan getting about $15,000. Okay, that's it. A and because of that, that means that the interest rate on that loan was 16%. It was effectively, because of all sorts of crazy math, was effectively about 57%. Wow. And because of that, that person got to keep all that money, and the person that lent it to them actually may be in trouble with the uh, police. So is this like a regular bank or is this some sort of like a loan shark that usually you, you see these issues with? In that case, I would call them a loan shark, but they are actually were just a private company that was doing lending. So is it, it so is, is there a term for it? Is it called usury? It is. Usury. It's called usurious, a usurious loan. So a usurious loan is one where the, so, so I think we need to backtrack a yeah. little bit. So what is a usurious loan? A usurious loan is one that has an interest rate that's over a certain amount, and it varies by state. Okay. In New York State, if it's criminally usurious, that means it's over 25%, uh, and there's various other restrictions. But if it's over that, then the person gets, essentially that money that was lent to them is deemed a gift. So if I loaned you money today, I can't charge you 100% interest? You could. But if someone ever called you on it, uh, you'd be in trouble. Ah, good. To, well, that's good. These are legally things that we, <laughs> the answer is no. No. Okay. So yeah, I mean, these are things that we need to know. So we also discussed some bankruptcy oh. um, cases too. So do you have any interesting bankruptcy stories? Oh yes. Um, I once represented an entertainer. Uh, hold on. I think we have a. I'm oh. sorry. I think we got a call. Let's just take it really quickly. Oh, looks like they hung up. Okay, we'll keep going. Oh no. <laughs> All right. So we once represented an entertainer that actually had, um, who performed services that were um, for a cash, it was a cash business, okay. which many entertainment industry people do, but um, she had tons of debt. And uh, we found out you know, that we were actually able to just, well, she not only had debt, but she also had tax debt. And through that case, we were actually able to get her to have a discharge of her tax debt. So a lot of people don't know that you can actually get tax debt removed. But how were you able to get her tax debt removed? Like The bankruptcy code says that if it's from a date that's three years or older mm -hmm. and um, you filed over two years ago, you can actually get a discharge. 
Is this something that, so, okay, and how much, I mean, can we discuss how much? Was it a was lot it, of money? It was a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. Maybe I'm in the wrong line. I know, I know. <laughs> a quarter of a million dollar in tech debt, that means she was making a lot of money. Okay, well, let me ask you another question. Sometimes we get we get questions from, you know, uh, tenants that live in houses, and they'll say to us, I just found out that the house that I live in and where I'm paying rent is actually in foreclosure. Can I stop paying rent? What is the question? You could, but you actually can't. You actually owe all of the money until the point of the person of you actually being evicted by the bank after their auction occurs or if the the owner right if the owner can evict. still the owner can evict you up to the point of losing their their ownership interest after an auction so I just wanted to reemphasize if you are a tenant in a house or property that you know for whatever reason that they are in a foreclosure proceeding okay that does not mean that you have to stop paying your rent we hear it a lot <laughs> I, know, I mean it makes sense you know they're saying well you're not paying your mortgage so why should i pay my rent but you know these are like little things that we need to you know keep into consideration great so we have a we have a bankruptcy story we had a quiet title story do you have any other interesting stories Ooh. um well there's a lot of cases oh we're, we're down in alabama now okay. we have a case down in alabama where we were brought down there because the the bank is now saying that my client does not own the property because it was transferred during a bankruptcy wow Okay. Um, I disagree right. completely with what the bank said, but it's an interesting issue that's bringing me to Alabama, which is an area <laughs> that I never thought I was going to be able to practice. Well, I actually have an interesting bankruptcy story. Ooh. Listen to this. So you know how a few episodes ago we discussed how it's really important to take the time and don't rush and really work with your lawyer and talk to them about, you know, what kind of assets you have. Because sometimes we feel that something may not be important and it can come back and it can really harm you, okay? So the story that I, you know, that I'm going to share with you is that there were somebody owned shares of a corporation. Corporation wasn't doing any business, right? So they thought, well, um, this is not an asset. Well, remember that 341 meeting that we were talking about where the creditors and the trustee get to examine you? Oh, yes. Well, they came up and they brought this up and they said, how come you didn't include the shares of your business into, you know, your petition? Even though at the end it was resolved and, you know, found out there this was, was Steve nothing. Jobs, right? <laughs> oh, it was Steve Jobs, right? Oh, it was Steve Jobs. Oh, man. <laughs> he owned shares of Apple and... <laughs> You know, he said, listen, it wasn't worth anything in a couple of years. No, I'm just joking. But <laughs> it's, um, it, you know, I, I think it's, it, it's... It's a valuable <laughs> lesson, for sure. Yeah. Everything is an asset. So, n you, let's go back to quiet titles. I mean, have you had any experiences where, for example, you have been able to clear somebody's, you know, house free and clear in a quiet title action? Yes. Okay. Uh, Last year alone, we got rid of about 24-ish million dollars in mortgages. And Wait, just last year? Just last year. Last year, Mr. Anderson got rid of $24 million in mortgages. Give or take. Thank you. Slow, slow clap. <laughs> slow clap, because <laughs> that's, I mean, that just shows how much, how many mistakes there are, how much error there is out there. And you really need a good eye to find something like this, right? It does. It does. And, and there's... You know, like we said, there's a lot of um, issues that the banks will have with it, and they'll come up with um, a lot of creative ways why they, they should be able to collect on the mortgage. Um, but we've even had a few instances where we'll file the inaction to remove the mortgage. Uh, hold on one second. Oh. We just got a call. Good evening. You're on Back to Basics. This is Preet Gill. Oh, sorry. I think I just accidentally <laughs> lost you. If you can please, please call us back. <laughs> well, <laughs> think. Okay. Man, <laughs> that was well, blunt. No, no. But anyways, I just wanted to, um, you know, reemphasize. Thank you so much oh, for yeah, being on the no show. Problem. You have walked us through so many things, um, you know, from bankruptcy to foreclosure to quiet title. And, you know, a lot of individuals sometimes feel like I'm, I'm in foreclosure and that's it. My life is over. No. You know, there's nothing I can do. I'm going to lose the house. And what ends up happening is it's, it's a really sad situation because instead of being proactive, and going to you know an attorney that knows what they're doing, they'll just ignore it, ignore it, ignore it, ignore it, when all these chances to 
have an opportunity to fix these mistakes or even challenge the bank's mistakes go by, you know? So there's only, what I would say to the audiences is there's only so much even the best attorneys can do because it depends, it's just like it's just like a doctor, you know? Like yeah. you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting because you, oh, my back hurts or whatever is going on and then at the end you're like, okay, I'm ready for my treatment. Right. And it's, but it's never too late, also. <laughs> yeah. Because rarely do I get a case that's at the beginning. Well, that's true. But what I say is always, you know, don't be so terrified. You know, th mm -hmm. there's always help. And uh, I, I believe, does your firm basically do f free consultations for something? All the time. Free consultations. Every consultation. Give free. a call to Mark Anderson. Mark, thank you so much for being on our show. If you have any other areas of expertise that you would love to come and teach us, we, we would, would be more back. than... Welcome. Thank you so Can much. Can I do a shout out? Uh, yes, absolutely. Shout out to Auntie Jean. <laughs> that, that's to my mom. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Well, everybody, I will be back right after the break. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for staying through all those important legal things that we've discussed. I just want to recap over the four weeks some of the important legal terms that we've discussed that you might hear when you are sitting in an attorney's office. And you can say, you know what? I actually know what that means. For example, the first thing we learned was statute of limitations, okay? Statute of limitations is the time in which anybody, right? Here we're talking about banks and debt collectors, the time that they have to sue you. All right, that time starts ticking. We also learned that an important fact that if you're thinking about filing for bankruptcy, over 600,000 bankruptcies were filed in 2018, so you're not alone. Speaking of bankruptcies, we also learned something that's called the automatic stay. The automatic stay is basically a, an, a device where everything gets frozen the very second that you file for bankruptcy. It's like magic, okay? Think about the phone calls you get from creditors, if there's a lawsuit happening, if your house is about to be foreclosed on, or let's say you're about to be evicted, right? So everything stops unless a judge lifts that stay, says the stay is not valid anymore, or there's other issues. It gives you a chance to breathe for a second, okay? We also learned a very important term today called usury. Usury loans, not all loans are actually legal. It depends on the interest. Now, as Mr. Anderson said, you can make whatever loan you want to, but every state is a little bit different. But in New York State, there are laws that say that if you're charging too much interest, it could be criminally usurious, okay, or maybe civilly as well. So we learned about that as well. We finally learned a term called quiet title. This is a lawsuit that you can file against the mortgage holder after you've successfully dismissed the case, the, or the foreclosure case against you, and you're gonna sue them now and say, not only have you made mistakes in the foreclosure action, but your mistake was so massive, okay, that you don't have any right to collect on this mortgage, and that lien that you have on my property is gone. And that, ladies and gentlemen, does happen. So now that we've finished the bankruptcy and foreclosure actions, do you really want to own a house? Because if you're thinking about owning real estate, I have a good surprise for you. Next week, we're going to start diving into the ins and outs of what to expect if you are in contract, or if you're thinking about buying your first home. So thank you for being with me tonight. I wish everybody a good night, and I will see you next week.